Uh, Hebrews. We're going to be in chapter 11 tonight. Uh, as we've said a couple of times now, we're going to be in this chapter for quite a while. <laughs> we're going to cover all of three verses tonight, five, six, seven. Um, so buckle your seatbelts. <laughs> the book itself is everything, as we have said many times now, it is everything in these last days that God has spoken to us in the person of his son, Jesus Christ. And the first ten and a half chapters of this book, that's not even true. <laughs> the first nine and a half chapters of this book, we're in the 11th. Um, nine and a half chapters of this book, they have been largely doctrinal in nature. Um, really just establishing a persuasive argument for the original Hebrew reader of this letter not to leave behind the simple faith in Jesus Christ, not to return to the law and the sacrificial system, because that's what was happening at this time. There were Hebrew believers who would come to a saving faith in Jesus Christ, and they were being ostracized by their families and by their communities, and they were missing the pageantry that the, tab the temple offered and the system of sacrifice offered. So they wanted to go back and the theme repeatedly through this letter is, don't do that. <laughs> don't do that. You are saved right now. You are saved by your faith in Jesus Christ. And throughout this letter, continually, Jesus has been portrayed as better, as better, over and over and over again. It started with, he is better than the angels. He was a better man. He's a better word. He is a complete and a fulfilled word in who he is. He's a better sanctuary a better high priest, and a better offering, better truly than anything that the law can offer, and better than anything that the world could offer us. He is better. And there's a distinct purpose in presenting Jesus this way. It's not just that, hey, Jesus is better. It's not in the mold of, you know, my dad can beat up your dad. That's not what this is. It's not just for betterment's sake. It's that Jesus is being established throughout this letter as a perfect object of faith a perfect object of faith, because he is the only deserving recipient of your faith. That's what's being established for us in this. That's why it's important that he is better, because we're giving him something in this. We're giving him something that only he deserves. We're giving him our faith and our hearts and our lives. And all of the practicality that this chapter offers and that these closing chapters offer, they will track back to this one singular idea that the just shall live by faith. It's not that the just shall live by works, and it's not that the just shall live by grand gestures or demonstrations. It's not that the just shall live by perfect church attendance. It's not that the church shall live, or that the just shall live by good behavior. It is simply that the just shall live by faith, and it is specifically that the just shall live by faith in Jesus Christ. That's the one element you cannot lose in all of this. It is faith in Jesus Christ that matters. This book has meticulously set up the truth in that context because anybody could have faith in anything. You can. It's not a wise thing to do, but you can have faith in anything you want. All of the world's religions, they will latch on to some sort of faith. Absolutely. People love the idea of faith. The world accepts the idea of faith. They will call you. They don't know what to call you as a Christian. They will call you a person of faith. Don't let them sell you short like that. You are a person whose faith is in Jesus Christ. The object matters entirely in this, in what we discuss. And this letter has been digging an impenetrable channel for us. And it's wrapping up with an extended urging to each one of us that to live by faith, we must live by faith in this superior being alone. You can't just live by faith. Not just by faith in anything. It has to be in, attached to the right object. He's the only one worthy of our faith. He's the only one worth having faith in. We saw in Romans chapter 12, this verse, we must not think of ourselves more highly than we ought, but think soberly, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. It is a gift from him. And that's what we're delving into in this chapter now. We talked about this as we opened the chapter last time. Nothing in what we read here in this very famous chapter, so many people call this the hall of faith, and then they start setting up everybody listed within as a hero of the faith. And that's not the right thing to do. This chapter is not intended to be consumed through the scope of be more like Abraham. Live your life more like Joseph. It's not that. Their faith is greater than yours. It's not that. It's simply live by the measure of faith that God has dealt to you. 
And just as these people that we're going to read about have done in their lives, the hero in this chapter, and the one hero in this chapter is Jesus Christ. Don't lose that as we move through. When you look at each event listed in this chapter, pay attention. I mean, when you really examine each piece, what you see truly is not a focus on the individual feats of the faithful. It's not that. Instead, you see a focus on faithful surrender to the feats of a mighty God. That's what this is about. Every instance of faith that we're going to see as we move through, it's going to take us four or five weeks, all told. But as we move through, each instance of faith is going to bear two very basic things in common. The first thing in each instance of faith listed is that each of these are an act of surrender. Each one that we read, they are an act of surrender. And number two, each instance of faith listed through this chapter, it speaks specifically of Jesus Christ, either in who he is, or in what he has done, or in what he continues to do. So keep that in mind as we work our way through. Each instance is an act of surrender. Each instance is a brilliant portrait of Jesus Christ. Recognize who the hero is as we move through. Last time we were together, we went through the very first thing that we saw, these instances of faith, they started from the very beginning of all things. And in that, it started with us. It said, by faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. We're the first people listed in the hall of faith. And we talked about that. We don't deserve to be on that list. And it would be the same response for any other individual that's listed subsequently from that. Nobody deserves to be on this list. It's about who the faith is in. By faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. He spoke everything that we see into existence. Just by the word of his mouth, he spoke it into being. There's tremendous power even just in God's word, as we, can say, we say almost every single week here. And we also saw that by faith, Abel offered a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. And that was fascinating. Continued to blow my mind this week, just in the things that we learned from that. Abel offered a living sacrifice. He offered an innocent life before God. And it was an offering that was in the model of what God had provided to cover Adam and Eve first. Whereas Cain offered from the fruits of his labors. He offered literally from the works of his hands. Now, this is the part that blew my mind this week. <laughs> Abel. Pay very close attention to the names and the meaning of the names as we move through this chapter. Abel means breath or vapor or sun or breathing spirit. Cain means something produced, something made, literally a work. And that is tremendously interesting. When you plug it into what we saw in verse 4 of this chapter last time we were together, which said, by faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. If you plug the meanings of their names into that verse, it says, by faith, breathing spirit offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than something produced. The spiritual offering matters. The surrender of a life into the hands of a mighty God, that matters. That is the more excellent sacrifice. It's more excellent than the works of our hands. More excellent than something that we can produce. And that tracks back to the grander picture that we see presented throughout Scripture. We saw back in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, we present our bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. We lay our lives down as believers in Jesus. We lay our lives down to God, and we live by the breathing Spirit. It's an amazing thing. Names matter. The names mentioned in this specific chapter, they matter greatly, so keep track as we go through. All of that being said, let's jump into what we're going to tackle tonight. Verse 5 it says, By faith, Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony, that he pleased God. So as much as we talked about none of these instances as we read through, they are not meant to trump in the works of man. As much as that's not the focus as we go through, it's equally true that none of these instances can just be glossed over or dismissed. We can't just glance at any one of these and say, well, I know the story of Enoch. Do we? <laughs> Do we know the story of Enoch? 
Because for each instance that we consider as we go through this chapter, we have to understand in each, in each singular piece, God did something incredible there. And he spoke something incredible through the lives of each person that is listed in this chapter. Enoch is kind of the living embodiment of Proverbs chapter 17, verse 27, which says, he who has knowledge spares his words. Because for Enoch, we have just a handful of sentences about him in the entirety of Scripture. And as we're going to see tonight, he plays a tremendously important role in understanding who we are as the church, as Jesus' beloved bride. If you want to turn with me, we have just a couple of sentences about him in Scripture, and we're going to read basically all of them tonight. Um, if you want to turn with me to Genesis chapter 5. Just a couple of verses, but these few verses, they convey a whole lot of knowledge. A whole lot of knowledge. He who has knowledge spares his words. Enoch lives this verse out. (laughs) You know this chapter. Uh, Genesis chapter 5, it traces the line of Adam to Noah. And there are remarkable, remarkable studies to be had throughout this entire chapter. And we're just going to touch on one small piece of it tonight. But it says in Genesis chapter 5, verse 21, Enoch lived 65 years and begot Methuselah. After he begot Methuselah, Enoch walked with God 300 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Enoch were 365 years. And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. That is the entire narrative that we have on Enoch. <laughs> he is the first person in Scripture. This takes special note of this. He is the first person in Scripture who is said to walk with God. He is the first of only three names in all of Scripture, in all 66 books, who is said specifically to walk with God. Understand that. He's the first of only three who would explicitly state this phrase, they walked with God. It's a fascinating thing, and we're going to get a whole lot into that tonight. Of course, of course there have been more who have walked with God through the generations. Of course. The Bible's full of them. (laughs) This room is full of them. You who walk with God. People who have served God with their entire lives. But God's word, his actual word, it specifically notes only three in in, in this phrasing. And Enoch was the first. And Enoch walked with God after he bore Methuselah. It's a fascinating thing to me. There is a moment in each parent's life where the entire thing just becomes too big for you. I think for the guys, it's the first time you have to change a diaper. But when you realize your relative size in the greater scheme of things, when you realize that your control in the greater scheme of things is nothing, there's a moment for you. You have this human life in your hands. You've been placed as steward over this life, and you don't know what in the world to do about it. And in that moment, you either cry out to God, who can handle all things, and who knows all things, or you can move forward through the rest of your life in fear and in frustration, just trying to live and do this thing, steward this child in your own strength, trying to control things that you have no control over, and understand things that you will never be able to understand. It is a hard, hard thing to do on your own. Choose God. I mean, choose Jesus. It is the best choice you will ever make. It would appear Enoch reached that point upon the birth of his son at the age of 65. (laughs) 65 years he walked this world. And understand for him, it wasn't the Garden of Eden. It was long departed from that at that point. He saw the ungodly things that were happening around him. It was a world that was just steeped in sin. He saw the conditions around him deteriorating and devolving into madness. And it troubled him such, understand this, it troubled him such that when he named his son, when he bore the son and it came time to name him, he named his son Methuselah. And again, names matter in this section of Scripture. Methuselah means his death shall bring. Enoch saw the depravity, and he saw the ungodliness all around him, and he knew prophetically that God's judgment would fall on this world very soon. He knew, 
He knew that things could not go on like this to the extent that he named his son his death shall bring. And sure enough, judgment would come upon this world with the great flood the very year that Methuselah died. I mean, Methuselah lived 782 years after he had Lamech. Lamech was 182 years old when he had Noah. Noah was 600 when the flood waters came. That means Methuselah died that year. It's an incredible thing. His death shall bring. But for Enoch, It's a remarkable pattern that he gives us. Instead of trying to shelter his son from this world that scared him to death, he lifted his son up to the living God instead. And he walked with God. 300 years he walked with God. His name, Enoch, means teaching. And that's exactly what he did with his life. He taught. And Noah, Enoch's great-grandson, Teachings, great-grandson, one who knew that his great-grandpa walked with God, one who knew that his great-grandpa had been taken home by God before he died. Noah never met Enoch, and Enoch never met Noah. They missed each other. Enoch was taken home 69 years before Noah was born. The reason that's significant is Noah is the second individual in Scripture to be said to walk with God. Genesis chapter 6, verse 9, it says, Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. Noah walked with God. Crespin talks Sunday morning about the tremendous impact a parent can have in a life, or a grandparent can have in a life, or a great-grandparent, the impact that they can have on the generations that follow. And you see that here in this story of Enoch. Enoch uniquely walked with God, and he never met his great-grandson. He couldn't pour those lessons directly into his great-grandson, but his great-grandson would do exactly the same as he. He would walk with God to the extent that we'll see in just a couple of verses, God will build the ark through the measure of faith that he gave to Noah. There's tremendous encouragement in this for us. Live this walk with the Lord. I mean, walk this walk. Really, really live it. (laughs) It has a ripple effect on those around you. It has an effect that you cannot see in the present. It has a ripple effect on those who will be raised by you. It has a ripple effect on those that they will raise. Enoch did not directly influence Noah. But the life, the story, the character, it was passed down. We do this to ourselves. We worry about what happens to our loved ones once we're gone from this world. We worry that they're not going to make it. We worry that God's going to somehow cease being as good as he was to us. See what happened here with Enoch. He wasn't there to see Noah's life, but Noah lived as Enoch lived. He walked with God. Walk this walk. It translates into the next generation, regardless of what happens to you here. Just think about that. Enoch did not see death. He was the first of men in two very specific things. He is the first to be said to walk with God, and he was the first of men who did not die. And he spoke of that with the way he lived. Turn with me to Jude, chapter 4, that's chapter 4, verse, verse 14. There's no chapters in Jude. I'm having a rough time tonight. <laughs> it's right before Revelation. Just keep in mind, Enoch listened to God, and he walked with God, and he taught what God showed him, just like his name suggested. But in Jude, verse 14, it says, Now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men also, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly among them, of all their ungodly deeds, which they have committed in an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. If you're counting, Enoch used the word ungodly four times in speaking of the judgment that God would bring upon this world, specifically against the apostate church. Enoch was a prophet of the coming judgment of God. 
He was a prophet of the coming judgment of God, both in the name that he gave his son, his death shall bring God's judgment, and in the words that he recorded here in Jude. The prophecy here is subject to much scholarly debate. I mean, we don't have any of Enoch's words in Genesis. What we just saw a couple of minutes ago, that is the entirety of what we have of him, but yet here we have a prophecy from him. And the scholars go crazy over trying to figure out how that could be. (laughs) There is a quote in an apocryphal book. There is a book of Enoch. It's not part of Scripture, so leave that for what it will be. But that quote nearly directly mirrors what we have here. So that's one thing. But understand that book itself, the book of Enoch, it did not appear until 100 years before Jesus was born. So take it for what you will. (laughs) Understand this is Jude who penned these words down to scroll. There is a very real possibility in this that this is something that Jesus told to Jude personally and directly, or that Jesus confirmed for Jude. I mean, remember, Jude was Jesus' younger brother. Surely they had some time to talk over the years. This could have come up. That's a possibility. We can't discount that in something like this. Another perfectly sound and reasonable possibility in this is that the Holy Spirit revealed this to Jude. The same as that John received the revelation. The same as Paul received his visions, or Isaiah, or Ezekiel, or David. The Holy Spirit is a perfectly viable source in something like this. Could have happened that way. But regardless of how we have these words, what's important to know is we have these words. They're recorded for us in the Holy Scripture. And what's important to understand is that Enoch teaches us simply in the short narrative that we have of him, and also in the few words that he spoke that we have recorded. But back in Hebrews, if you want to turn back there, understand in all of this, Enoch teaches us something, that there is something other than death for the believer in Jesus Christ. Something other than death for the one who walks with God. He was taken. He spoke of God returning with his saints in his prophecy. That meant they had to get there somehow, right? Right? Enoch, understand, Enoch is a picture of the church, and he's a picture of the rapture, a picture of God's plan to eventually return and gather his church to himself in the flash of an eye. And that will happen in a day and an hour that none of us know, and nobody knows. But many believers, the thing in that, outside of the rapture, is many believers will go home before then. And in Enoch, we also have a tremendous picture of them also. When we walk with God, any one of us who walks with God, when our heart ceases to beat here on earth before the rapture, we will be brought home into God's presence, into eternal life. We will be taken and found here no more, just like Enoch. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8 says, We are confident, yes, well pleased rather, to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. In John chapter 11, when Lazarus dies... And Martha kind of challenges the Lord Jesus. She said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give to you. And Jesus tells her in that moment, your brother will rise again. And Martha says, I know he'll rise again someday. (laughs) I know he'll rise again in the resurrection at the last day, but that's forever from now. In John chapter 11, verse 25, Jesus says to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Effectively, there is no more waiting for that. I'm what you are speaking of. I am the resurrection. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? He asked her. Do you believe this? Whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And of course, we know that Lazarus lived Jesus brought him back from the dead just to show that his words were not empty. I am the resurrection. Watch what I'm going to do next. (laughs) And a short time later, Jesus himself would raise from the dead just to put the exclamation point on it. He is the resurrection, and he is the life. Whoever lives and believes in him shall never die. Those are his words. It's not words somebody made up about him. Those are his words. Whoever Whoever lives and believes in him shall be as Enoch. We walk with God, and then we are taken home. In Jesus, there is never death. 
It's an amazing thing. So much of this letter to the Hebrews, it has been communicating this basic truth that in Jesus, we have access to the Holy of Holies in heaven forevermore, eternally. We have life forevermore. When we cease to be here, we will be there. And that's the lesson we are taught in Enoch. Enoch had this testimony that he pleased God. Highlight that. That was Enoch's testimony, that he pleased God. That should be the aim for each one of us as believers in Jesus Christ. I want that testimony. But again, this whole book keeps directing back to the idea that you cannot please God in your efforts or in your works. We want to please God. We're so overwhelmed by what it is he's given us in his grace. We want to please him, and we so often automatically default to our own merits. I'm going to show you how much I am grateful for this. I'm going to earn this. He says, stop it. <laughs> we get so discouraged when our merit doesn't line up with his standard. And that completely misses the nature of God's grace. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, it says here, But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Understand this section. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. It's impossible to please God without faith, without simply listening to his word and obeying his word in faith. It is impossible to please God. Faith is what pleases God. This whole chapter is showing us what that faith is supposed to look like. Confident obedience to God's word in each case. Confident obedience to God's word regardless of circumstance, regardless of consequence. We're going to repeat that at least a hundred times before we're done with this chapter, because that is true faith. For anybody to choose this path, for anybody to choose this walk with Jesus, it is a path of absolute surrender and continual surrender to him. For anybody to choose this path, we must believe that he is God. We must. He must truly be God over your life to obey him in the difficult things. To obey him in the things that we can't begin to understand, you have to believe that he's God and that he's bigger than whatever it is that you're up against. Otherwise, it's just not going to (laughs) work. To come to God, we have to find our rest in who he is. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 2, it says, Do not be rash with your mouth, and let not your heart utter anything hastily before God. For God is in heaven, and you are on earth. Therefore, let your words be few. To truly come to God, you must believe that he truly is God over all things. But it says here he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. This phrase, diligently seek, in the original Greek, it is exiteo. That's a fun word. (laughs) Exiteo. It means to investigate. It means to crave. That one just knocked me off my feet. (laughs) To demand. To worship to inquire, to seek after carefully. Faith is what pleases God. He will reward those not who ace the trials of life. He will reward those not who do the most good. He is a rewarder of those who crave him, who seek after him carefully, who inquire of him. He is a rewarder of those who worship him, who investigate him in his word, and his will faithfully and fervently. He is a rewarder of those who demand nothing less of themselves than to be in his presence continually. Those who take full advantage of this wonderful, glorious, undeserved access to the God of all creation. He is a rewarder of those who say, for myself, I demand of my days to be with him. God rewards that. And the thing is, In all of that, the devil will take all of your failures in life, in all of your regrets, in all of your shame, and try to convince you that you should run anywhere else but into the arms of the God who loves you. That's his whole game, preventing you from doing the very thing that God rewards, preventing you from doing the very thing that pleases God. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. And this Enoch... This teacher, by faith, was taken away so that he did not see death. 
And we understand, Enoch saw what this world was. He saw what this world was coming to. He saw who he was in comparison with all of it, and he knew he should go down with them. He saw what it was all coming to. And rather than hide and run and fight with his life, he simply walked with God, earnestly sought after him. He craved God for many years, 300 years, seeing what the world around him was coming to, and he just kept walking with God. And understand, in what we read in that genealogy, if you go through Genesis chapter 5 in its entirety, and I recommend you do, to that point, to that moment in human history, all of humankind, to that point, was a running proof of Satan's lies and deceit. Satan's words to Eve in the Garden of Eden in Genesis chapter 3 verse 6 were, you shall not surely die. In all of Genesis chapter 5 is, and he died, and he died, and he died. Adam, then Seth, then Enosh, and then Canaan, then Mahalalel, and then Jared. Six times, and he died, and he died. You shall surely die. (laughs) Six times. Six times the generations met the same end. And we know that throughout Scripture, six is the number of man. It's the number of man's efforts in our works. And six times we see, and he died. But then the seventh generation, the number of God's completion, the number of God's rest, this Enoch came seventh in line, and he walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. It's a picture of the church being taken away from this world, and then we were not. It's a picture that was painted in the seventh generation from Adam. Seven is God's number for completion and rest. It's just remarkable. And this happened by faith. Enoch pleased God. This is said, understand, this is said of only two individuals in Scripture that they pleased God. One is Enoch, the other one's Jesus. The heavens opened up with Jesus, and God the Father's voice came out. This is my Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. Who pleases God? Think about that. Who is it who pleases God? Those who walk with him and those who listen to his son. And what is this entire letter? How do we begin every single week, everything in these last days that God has spoken through the person of his son, Jesus Christ? The one who pleases God is the one who walks with him and the one who listens to what he has spoken through his son. Walk with him. Hear him. In all of this, too, understand the seriousness of unbelief. In the face of all of this immense faith that we get to see, understand that if without faith it's impossible to please God, understand equally that to live in disbelief, to live without faith, is to live displeasing to God. To try to live by anything other than faith, that is displeasing to our God. Understand that. 1 John chapter 5, verse 10 says, He who believes in the Son of God has the witness in himself. He who does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed the testimony that God has given of his Son. When you live in unbelief, you make God out to be a liar. When you do not believe the very things we are going through in this book, you make God out to be a liar when you don't believe the testimony that God has given us in his Son, when you make God out to be a liar. William MacDonald said, Faith is the only thing that gives God his proper place. Faith is the only thing that gives God his proper place. And faith puts man in his place, too. Understand, this is a humbling portion of Scripture. We, We believe in the thing that God has measured out to us. It puts us in our place. It puts God in his rightful place. And that's the way it should be. True faith proves that we have more confidence in God's eyesight than our own. Understand that. It's a hard thing to let go. We let go of the things we see in deference to what he sees. Knowing that what he sees down the road, it is for our good. And it's for the good of all those who love him. That's what it must be. But in verse 7 here, it says, By faith Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, Moved with godly fear, Noah prepared an ark for the saving of his household, 
by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. Again, we see one being warned and aware of things not yet seen. This whole chapter, faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. And Noah falls into that mold. But if you want to flip back with me to Genesis chapter 6, we read the first, the opening portion of this, but we're going to get to the rest of it. It's kind of a survey course in the beginning of uh, Genesis here. It's worth reading on your own, but we're going to touch on it tonight. In Genesis chapter 6, verse 9, it says, This is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. Noah walked with God. We read that already. And Noah begot three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth was also corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. So God looked upon the earth, and indeed it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And at that point, following that, Noah was warned of great rains. Great floodwaters to come on the earth. And it's an amazing thing because to that point in time, nobody had ever seen anything like that. Noah was warned of something not just that was still yet to come. It was something that had never been seen at all before. And the thing is, in Genesis chapter 2, verse 4, it says, The Lord God had not caused it to rain on the earth, and there was no man to till the, the ground But a mist went up from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. So it would suggest in that that there was no rain. And it's possible in the time between God in the Garden of Eden and the time of Noah, it's possible it did rain in the interim. But what's interesting is is that Scripture does not speak of the topic of rain again until God sends this flood of judgment on the world. But God told Noah to build an ark. And by faith, By confident obedience to God's word, regardless of circumstance, regardless of consequence, that's exactly what Noah did. He built something that nobody had ever built, (laughs) built something that nobody had ever seen before. And when they asked him what in the world he's doing, he'd have to tell them it's for conditions that they'd never seen before, for a judgment that they'd never seen before. And he'd have to tell them that God said it would be so. That's faith. (laughs) That's faith. And it's a remarkable thing. Enoch's name means teaching, and he taught by his way of life. Noah's name means rest or comfort. And understand, by Noah's faith in what God had told him, God provided rest and comfort for mankind. Without Noah, we don't survive. Without Noah, we never see Jesus. Understand that. His family was provided rest and comfort, but mankind as a whole was provided rest and comfort through Noah's obedience to God's word. And understand in that, it was available to anybody. That door of that ark, it was open. And it was open until the moment that God shut it. Noah did not shut that door. He built what God told him to build, and he left it open for anybody who would come in. And when the time came, God shut that door. And only at the appointed time. You run this whole list of names from Enoch to Noah in Genesis chapter 5. You don't have to look at it. I'm going to read them to you. Enoch means teaching, and his son Methuselah means his death shall bring. And Methuselah's son's name, Lamech, his name means the despairing, and Noah means rest. And when you read them through in order by the meanings of their name, and of course the whole line of Adam, if you were to take the whole thing as an entire ball, it spells out something much more intricate, much more glorious, but we're going to have to cover that another night. When you cover just these names, From Enoch to Noah, the names in their meanings read, Teaching his death shall bring the despairing rest by faith. By faith, this is what's taught through these men. Understand, it's an incredible thing. We have seen now in this chapter the offering of a greater sacrifice by faith. We've seen a life given holy and a life given by the Spirit. We've seen walking with the living God by faith. And that life was extended into eternity to walk with God and then to be taken home by him. We've seen, by faith, listening to God about future things to come and then speaking of those things to those he has placed you around, by faith. We've seen building up and edifying that vessel that would be the life of Enoch for so many, the deliverance of so many. 
we've seen this idea of inviting anyone in who would come in, building something by God's direction and by God's design and by God's hand to house and deliver those who would otherwise be subject to judgment. Understand what we're seeing. This is us as his church. Teaching his death shall bring the despairing rest. We do this because God's judgment is coming, and it's coming rapidly. That is why we do what we do. We see the end of those who don't walk with God. We've been told the end of those who don't walk with God in his word. We've been warned repeatedly through his word. We've been warned of exactly what's going to happen. By faith, we are moved with godly fear to set about being of use in our Lord's hands as he builds the ship that's going to deliver us home. Think about that. Proverbs chapter 8, verse 30 through 31 speaks of Jesus in this way. It says, Then I was beside him as a master craftsman, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him, rejoicing in his, in his inhabited world, and my delight was with the sons of men. Understand, Jesus is the master craftsman. Jesus is the master teacher. There were three in Scripture who were said specifically to walk with God. Noah, the craftsman. Enoch, the teacher. And the third, and we're going to close with this, comes in the book of Malachi. And turn to Malachi chapter 2 with me. It's right before Matthew, the last book in the Old Testament. Malachi chapter 2, if you drop down to verse 4, what you need to understand about this section of Scripture is these are the words of the Lord. These are the words that the Lord spoke through Malachi. And in verse 4 of chapter 2, it says, Then you shall know that I have sent this commandment to you, that my covenant with Levi may continue, says the Lord of hosts. My covenant was with him, Levi, one of life and peace, And I gave them to him that he might fear me. So he feared me and was reverent before my name. The law of truth was in his mouth, and injustice was not found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and equity and turned many away from iniquity. For the lips of a priest should keep knowledge, and people should seek the law from his mouth. For he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. Three names in Scripture said to walk with God. Enoch, Noah, and Levi. And this name Levi means united. Of all of Jacob's sons, understand this. Levi was not a great guy. (laughs) He participated in the plot to sell his brother Joseph into slavery. And that's basically all we know about him in that instance. Reuben and Simeon and Judah, they all had redemptive arcs in the whole tale with, jo- with Joseph. They did things to try and make it right. Levi's kind of absent in that whole thing. The one thing he does do is just a bloody mess. He slaughters a tribe. <laughs> we don't have a record of Levi the man doing anything good in Scripture, anything godly. When Jacob blessed his sons at the end of his life, he got to Levi and cursed him for his cruelty and his wrath. And what's fascinating in this is God brought the line of his priests through this same tribe, through this same man, through this Levi. In God speaking now in Malachi, he draws on the name of the one who was completely unworthy of this. His life did not match up with what we read here. He drew on the name of the one to portray the lives of the many priests who served the Lord and did walk with the Lord. The priests who had been called out specifically to fulfill the role we read about here in Malachi, to be one in representation of the many. And in Malachi it says, Levi walked with God in peace, in equity. He feared God. He was reverent. The law of truth was in his mouth. He turned many away from iniquity. This is our call. Understand this, as a member of the kingdom of priests in Jesus' kingdom, this is our call. This is what we are to do as priests. Three names said to walk with God 
in, this, in the entirety of Scripture that we have. A teacher, a builder, and a priest. Each one is a representation of the master teacher and the master craftsman and our great high priest, the one who teaches us and the one who is our rest and who is our refuge, one who represents the many to the living God and one who represents the living God to the many, the one who unites us to God, the one who levies us to God. Walk with God. Crave him. Crave Jesus with your life. It is only by faith in him that we can ever please him. Next week, we're going to get into Abraham, and that's going to be a whole lot of fun. Let's go ahead and pray. And Father God, you are so good to us. You've given us such a deep treasure in your word. You just continue to draw us along and continue to show us more about who you are. And the truth is, Lord, when we get to see you face to face in heaven, what we know here is just going to be a shred and a scrap of who you truly are. And we thank you that we can have that kind of earnest expectation, and that joyful hope of what's still to come in your presence. We just, we want to live our lives in a way that lines up with what we studied tonight, where we do walk with you and we do surrender our lives to you where we teach what you've told us, and we build this church that you're building by the hand of your Son. Lord, we want to serve as priests. We want to serve as representatives of who you are in this world that is desperately seeking something that makes sense.